Hello, I'm Allison Charney, and this is Preformance's Season of Hope. In this series of concert and conversation with some of today's most sought after classical musicians, we will explore the theme of hope while offering Preformance's signature ungoogleable insights into the music we make. We will also address the existential question, if musicians are making music, but there's no one there to hear it, have we made music? My answer is not without you, our audience. By being here to listen, you are playing a critical role in the experience we are going to share together. I am delighted to welcome to Preformance's Season of Hope, cellist and my friend Peter Seidenberg. Welcome Peter. It's so great to be here. I'm, I feel so lucky that you asked me to do this um, and what uh, I should just fess up right. I just uh, I just am burnt out. I'm so tired and I don't want to think I don't want to introspect too much and and playing cello and performing is you have to kind of tear yourself down a lot and I just don't didn't want to go there so and you asked me to do this and I said yes and then I called you up a few days later and I was like um you know I'm kind of tired what do you think and then you had this clever way of pulling <laughs> me in without my even knowing it you just were like and then by the end of our conversation we had like we had a whole we had enough for several podcasts. I was going to say, by the end of our conversation, you were proposing piece after piece after piece after piece that we had no time to do. So we'll have to figure out another way to uh, get all that music done. Let's talk about some of the music that you are going to preform for us today. Um, so I'd like to talk about the Bach movement of a sonata that you're going to do. Um, and for those people who might really be in the know, they might be wondering about this choice because Peter is, I can guarantee you, a cellist and he does play only the cello, but this is a piece that Bach imagined would be played by a violin. Yes, um, he didn't just imagine it, it's actually written on the music, it says violin. <laughs> <laughs> I was giving so, you a little leeway, but yeah. One of the ways that I am imagining this word hope in the title of this season, Season of Hope, is that I, I want to give license, I want to give freedom to the artists to perhaps do a piece that they would never ever have done yeah. before in the real world. Um, a piece that they've just always wished they could play, always hoped they could play, whatever for whatever reason. Um, I was sort of imagining it with singers that you know maybe there's a bass aria that a soprano has already always loved and why not sing it? Uh, yeah. Very similar. But I hadn't really thought of it in terms of, you know, why not a cellist play a violin part? And I, when I say that about soprano and bass, I can make the transposition in my head, but I wonder for the strings, um, are you playing it in the same register that a violin would play? In other words, is it the same C when you play a C, or are you playing a C an octave lower than where the violin would play? How does that work? Yeah, so I, I, play, um, I play this piece in an octave lower but it's exactly the same pitches, it's just, it's just lowered by one octave, except for there's really a couple of cool things. I, <laughs> because I have a lower string than the violin, there's a couple of places where I get to utilize my C string, um, two places toward the end. So the, this piece is in F major, and, it, um, and there's, there's this chord where the, the, uh, um, the root of the, the chord would be um, would be the F, which is the tonic of the uh, of the piece. And violinists can't play it, so they have to play the third above the F. They have to play the A. Yeah. So, if you can imagine, for example, the song Do Re Mi from Sound of Music, Peter is able to play Do. He's able to play in that moment the grounding root note, whereas a violinist ends up on Mi Do Re Mi and that gives you a slightly different feeling than this grounding connection to the earth moment. <laughs> yeah, so I get to play this F. So I, you know, escape down, or I actually don't escape. They have to escape to the to the third of the chord. So to be clear, Bach wrote an A. He wrote an A, so oh my gosh, strike me down. I actually changed JSB's music um, 
I, you know, now this is going out to the world or whoever's listening. I, I hope I don't get my license taken, revoked. Yeah, yeah, yeah your music <laughs> license revoked. For all we know, Bach would be like many of the living composers I know you work with frequently and say, cool, do the F. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then at the very end, the penultimate quarter, right, be right before the end, um, I get to play um, for this dominant chord, I get to play the low C and the violinist can't do that. And it just, ooh. It's juicy, right? <laughs> right before the end. It's so the fun. dominant chord is the is a chord that's formed on the fifth scale degree. So that would be like do re mi fa so if we're still sticking with the uh, sound of music <laughs> as a guide. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in F major, I assume we're still in F major. The dominant chord would be based on a C. Um, C. There it is. There so it is. you know what? If I were had been a little more clever about my answer you would say why are you playing this piece and i said well because i can i can play a low f in and i can play a low c violence can't so that's why i chose this piece <laughs> not this piece to me reminds me of those shots from like the space uh station or something or from like look at from being sit, standing on the moon and looking at the earth it's like the the inexorable slow turn of you know of life of it's just there's something so deeply deeply philosophical about this piece that you cannot put it into words and it just it's so touching and so hopeful and now we will hear peter play the third movement of bach's c major sonata for violin for cello
That was the third movement of Bach's C major violin sonata played on the cello by Peter Seidenberg. So let's talk about some grand opera. Uh, <laughs> because together we are going to do an aria that has a beautiful cello solo from Verdi's Un Ballo in Maschera. And this is the aria Moroma Prima in Grazia. And um, one of the things that I want to talk about is the fact that you wanted to be looking at while you played this, not the cello part only, but the full score, or well, the piano vocal score. Um, in other words, normally in an orchestra situation, the orchestra members are looking at really just in their own little world. They're just seeing their own notes. And maybe that'll change in the land of iPads, putting music on iPads, but it's to reduce the number of pages that the instrumentalists have to have on their stands because the stand can only hold so many pages of music. And it's really tricky to take your hand off your instrument to turn pages. Um, but I've always been astonished to realize that it is possible, therefore, to play an entire opera and not have a clue what a single word is in the opera or who's singing at any given time, or even if you're a cellist, what the trumpet is playing or what the timpani is doing, or there's no way to know what else is going on other than listening in the moment, which is certainly a good thing to do. Um, but Peter, you really wanted for this to be able to, I assume, to see my part go by and to see the words. And I wonder if I mean, you can talk about that. Cello parts are all secrets, you know, and the score is the teacher's manual, as it were. And I, uh, ever since I started using my iPad, I, uh, I realized that playing off the score made me a much more reliable an informed musician and that I could do so much more. I could, I could be so much more collaborative and supportive. Of course, uh, in a piece like this, you are the star and I'm, uh, accompanying you. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, as you and I talked about it before, I'm the conscience, you know, or the, the, I'm, I was thinking of, you know, like the Greek chorus. Uh, and um, so. You know, Peter, in this aria, I don't, as the singer, I don't hear the cello as being a support system, but as being, I mean, I think just that, like the inner truth and the inner monologue and the, the impetus for the emotion. Mm. Maybe that's just the way you play it. <laughs> oh, I was about to say, uh-oh, we, maybe we should re-record this. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody understands, like, one of the challenges of all of this is that we can't, unfortunately, play it at the same time. You can't play and I can't sing at the same time because of all these latency issues. And there is no making synchronized music at the same time, the same thing, um, in this platform. It just, it just doesn't happen. Uh, it can't happen. Oh. So we have to, each of us, take a turn. And, right. And have each other's recorded music in our ear. It's just a whole new. A whole I was so, um, but I'm lucky in this situation for this aria because I got to hear you sing it and I studied it. Uh, the, and I studied the words and I studied the way you, you interpreted and presented the text. And it gave me such a deeper insight into into how to play it you know i have to say there's one part of this so you know again it is pre-recorded um but there's one part that um on the on the word spain talama i take so much time in an inappropriate way and the reason for it is because i was listening to craig i misunderstood when i should come in and so i came in too early and i could hear that craig was not playing yet. And so I just held on, on so I could catch up. I know exactly what you're talking about. And it, it gives it a kind of longing the way you, it's like, uh, uh, it's like an appoggiatura in a way, except for, you know, it's because you start before the bar line. It's like the harmony. It's like a suspension. Yeah. Uh, pre-suspension as it were yeah i mean again it, it really really is cool it's very tenuto like you know i may it was fun I may, to play off of that i may well get my musician license revoked for that moment 
can you tell me a little bit uh, about the about the, the text in the, the context of the text? Um, so this aria is sung by a wife to her very powerful husband saying, I understand that you have sentenced me to death. You know the way it goes in marriage. <laughs> Right. Divorce, no. Death. Death, you know. no problem. That's Jack, Jack Benny thing. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I will die, Moro. I will accept this fate, but not before I hug my son, my only son, one more time. And you can deny me this favor, this deep request as a spouse, but surely you cannot deny me the mother of your child. You know, it actually, when I think about it right now, and I've never thought about this before, there's something biblical about the text. She says, my son, my only son. And God says to Abraham, when he asks for the sacrifice of Isaac, the binding of Isaac, he says, take your son, your only son, um, which is a moment of great mm. um, scholarly questioning, I think. Um, but that line about my son, my olunico filio, my only son, um, that always gets me. Yeah. Like, cause just imagine, and it is very easy for me to imagine the bond of a mother to a son since I have two, but I could imagine having only one that that bond is, is fierce. Fierce. <laughs> yes, indeed. So wow. why don't we together with the brilliant pianist Craig Ketter. Yeah, the genius that. Craig. Genius Craig Ketter. <laughs> um, hashtag genius. Um, why don't we do now Moro Ma Prima In Grazia from Un Ballo in Mascara by Giuseppe Verdi. Thank 
from Verdi's great opera, Un Ballo in Mascara, Masked Ball, performed by me, Alison Charney Soprano, Peter Seidenberg Cello, and the genius Craig Hedder Piano. So let's talk about this beautiful piece, Prayer, by Ernest Bloch. This happens to be a great piece of music that, that happens to be written for cello. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, and, and maybe one of Bloch's greatest pieces, you know, probably top, top five of his pieces. It's just, it's extremely well known from as from his, you know, body of work. And there's a great reason uh, because uh, it's so full of fantasy and imagination and, um, and soul and- And liturgy. Yes, right. I, I, it's true. But this is a typical theme throughout this program. Interesting. We knew that. Um, we planned it that way. I feel like when you're a musician, your religion is music. So even if you aren't a practicing religious person, you understand the the religio religiosity of some of these characters in the Bach that we just heard. That, that world turning, I feel like, I feel so spiritual when I, when, when I, when I think of that. So I think we should, um, hear, actually before we hear you play it, I want to admit to something with this piece. So Peter first recorded this piece thinking that he would be playing it as a solo cello piece, even though it's written for cello and piano. And then the fabulous Craig Kenner said, can try to play it too. And genius, so the Craig. genius, Craig Ketter, genius. Um, I actually, we're joking, but we mean it. <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah, so, so, so everyone, imagine that I played this piece by myself uh, a couple months ago, because that's why not, I had the beard. Not imagining. Oh, yes, we should make yeah. the fact that you had more hair on your face. Yeah, yeah and less hair on my head. Like it just, <laughs> I just moved everything upside down. And um, it, and I just played it thinking, didn't thinking, think at all about a piano part. And then, go ahead. And then Craig just, you know, put his headphones on and had Peter, to be fair, I sent him the video also so he could watch Peter at the same time as he listened to Peter, which is really important because you can see the bow change, you can see the shift of the strings, you can see the fingers on the strings making the note changes, and that really helps understand the timing of the piece as well as listening to it. And Craig was able to play the piano part that Bloch wrote perfectly in sync with yeah. Peter. So this was, I mean, this is how we're doing all music these days, but this was really not meant to be. Um, until Craig put his genius on it. And so now uh, I cannot wait for you all to hear Peter Seidenberg cellist and Craig Ketter pianist play Ernest Bloch's Prayer. <laughs> Thank you. 
And that was Prayer by Ernest Bloch, played by Peter Seidenberg, cellist, and Craig Ketter, pianist. So we go from one prayer to another. Um, the, this next piece has the name of a prayer. It's called Kaddish. And Kaddish is the name of the Jewish prayer, the, the prayer for mourners. So this piece was composed by Mariana Rosette, with words by Brooke Bailey Johnson. And this is from this piece, Kaddish is from this bigger piece called Ghost Brothers. And it is the story of Mariana's life, really. Um, she was born just after World War II to parents who had had a previous marriage and a previous family um, who tragically perished at the hands of the Nazis in um, concentration camps in during the Holocaust. And um, her father in particular did not talk about what had happened and immediately after the Holocaust married her mother and immediately began creating a new family. And he never talked about anything that had happened. And she would get these clues. She would see a family portrait, for example, a family picture, and there would be a young child in the picture who kind of looked like her, but whom she had never met. And anyway, over time, she realized that that was her half-brother who had died. Um, so heartbreaking. It's, it's agonizing. And so apparently this was a really common experience for children born in Europe at this time to parents who were, you know, sort of getting a, a tragic do-over. And they lived with these untold secrets and so she refers to these siblings as her ghost brothers. It incorporates the, the Hebrew and Aramaic words of this prayer, the Kaddish, Yitkadav um, Yitkadash um, Rabbah, for example. And actually, even more poignant for me as a as a studier and, and learner and lover of language. Um, They've asked, they've written the text, not in modern Hebrew, which would pronounce that as, just as I just did, which is how I learned it, Yitzchadal v'yitzchadal shemei rabah, but in the old-fashioned Hebrew, Yitzchadal v'yitzchadal shemei rabah. To me, that difference is my saying it or my grandparents saying it. My grandparents would never have learned the t sound for that letter. It would have been a s sound. So they would never have said it yitzkadal. They would have said yitzkadal. And so that moment when I sing yitzkadal, the yitzkadash, it connects me immediately in a chain to my grandparents. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. And to, to understand that, I mean, it's, the, the the piece is heartbreaking. It's it was a it's a it's it's a challenge to to play because it's so sad. It's just uh, um, and hearing you sing it and I listened to it multiple times. Of course, is 
brought me into that world and into that story understanding but now you're talking about how there's this bridge to the past this little sonic subtle bridge to the past is it's even more profound there's also you know in the sadness i mean just as you know just you can't experience sadness without understanding joy um and there is there is hope and yeah, like, there's even playfulness as well. Right? There's, there's yeah. like a little some playful playing. Um, yeah, that goes on in in, in the pieces. It's, it's true to the composer's feeling about her life that you know there was this horrible grief that was sort of underlying everything, and yet there was joy and happiness. And let's face it, for her parents, there was a new beginning. I mean, they were able to create again and create life and make a future. Um, and as much as, you know, I mean, the Jewish people certainly throughout history have been, um, you know, people have wanted to destroy the Jewish people over and over again in generation and generation. And somehow this tiny people have sustained themselves and continued. Um, and here is Mariana, the daughter of this family, creating this beautiful music for us to share. I did want to talk a little bit about the complexity of putting this piece in particular together in this virtual world. Um, one of the things that that has been sort of standard for performance this season of hope is that we've we've recorded things in general sort of n plus one I'm calling it meaning the first person puts down their part the second person listens to the first person and puts down their part my editor my 15 year old son puts those two parts together the third Evan the genius Evan the genius um, <laughs> genius is the theme of this episode genius and liturgy uh, <laughs> so and then the third person will listen to the first person and the second person together and then we put person 2 and person 3 together and that goes back to person 1 who now gets to listen to person two and person three, and then we get person one back in. But for this piece, what we found is that nobody could go first. There was no <laughs> way to go first on this piece. And so we needed N plus a gazillion because yeah. we needed to keep hearing each other out the whole piece. There was just, I, I, there was no way to do it isolated. Right, we all, I mean, or another way of looking is we all went first and then were extracted and then re-layered. Um, and, and, you'll, and you'll hear that the piece starts with a cello solo and then, and, and everybody has moments of, of singing or playing by themselves. And Peter, how did, so how did you handle that on your end? Well, um, one of the things that I did, I mean, this is a huge learning curve, the, the, um, putting all of this together, um, not just this piece. But what I realized is, I mean, I had to have an iPad in front of me with my, with my score. I had to have a foot pedal to turn. I had to have uh, an iPad behind me, I mean, behind, sorry, behind the score to have a, you know, a, a dead on view of me playing. Um, and then I had to have my uh, earbuds in so that I could hear the recording, which was a video on my iPhone, which I realized I, the best thing for me to do was to put it to my left, put it to my left, high up, like, you know, um, uh, um, Allison height. That's not so high, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for a cellist, I'm sitting. You seem, your stature is. By five foot three and a half seems huge if you're sitting down. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like way up there. So I put you and Craig on a stand high up to my left with my little iPhone. So you may see when you watch this, for those of you that are wa watching this instead of hearing it as a podcast, you'll, um, you'll see that I lean to my left and cue or, or take a cue from from Allison or Craig, I'm looking this way. Uh, and I do it in, 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 in our other ensemble, uh, 
and all three ensemble pieces, I'm always looking this way to make, to make music. You know, I too look to my right um, at you in my imagination. I mean, I, I look to my right, you're in my imagination, not because I have the iPhone there or a visual image of you, but that's just the way we would be if we were doing yeah. it live. If you can imagine the piano is sort of in the back a little bit and the soprano is in the crook of the piano and then the cellist is off to sort of almost parallel with the seat of the piano. Um, you know, or s sort of. And so it's just natural for me to turn to the right to look at you playing cello. And I found myself doing that just, you know, naturally just turning to look at you. Um, so it's a little Brady Bunch-ish. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. But you know what? It really is, honest to God, it's music making. I mean, it really, uh, the way, we, especially this piece, because we did multiple takes of the same material. So it evolved. It's like we rehearsed. Yeah. 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 It was a little bit more like rehearsal. I too needed but, to, you know, one. I needed to see Craig. And so I had my iPhone on my music stand right in front of me, but out of view of the camera, because I could not get this one entrance right. Mm. And if I watched him and I watched his hands go down in the keys. I got it right. It's great. And by the way, let me just say this. It's the best kind of rehearsal because there was no talking. It was no arguing. <laughs> no discussion. It was just, I send you a track, you listen to it. You, you revise your track, you stick it back, you bring, bring it back to me. And it was so good. <laughs> you cursed at me without my being there. Like, why would you do it like that? Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't you breathe there? <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting because there are a couple of passes um, for all of us. And uh, the way the person passed it was that's, you know, that's what you got. And, you know, there's so many ways to interpret music and, and many of them are, are good and work really well. Well, and, when you say that about the pass, it's like in football, if somebody throws you the ball and you're on the run and you catch it and it's not perfect, it's not, doesn't just land, doesn't just drop in your hands perfectly. And so you have to sort of fumble, I don't mean fumble, fumble, but you yeah, have yeah. to sort of struggle with- Choreograph it. your movement. And, and change your hands just a little bit and change the angle of your body because that was the pass you were throwing and you want to get to the, to, the, to the line, you want to make a touchdown. And so you've got to just take what you've got and keep going and make it magic. Not that anybody threw any passes that weren't beautifully done to each other, but it no, they all worked. It maybe wasn't exactly what you were imagining in your ear right. was going to happen. That's right. So, uh, you know, hence it's real music making because that happens on stage. I was going to say, which is what happens live, right? Things happen all the time live, and you think like, "Whoa, okay, I guess I'm going to do this then." If that's yeah, okay. yeah, and that's good. So I think we should um, show what we've come up with. Yeah. Um, and here is Mariana Rosette and Brooke Bailey Johnson's gorgeous piece, Kaddish, from their larger work, Ghost Brothers, performed by me, Allison Charney Soprano, cellist Peter Seidenberg, and pianist Craig Ketter. <laughs> Thank you. 
from Ghost Brothers by Mariana Rosette. I found another theme. Oh, well, yes, other than genius and liturgy. Yeah, mom. So what's the next piece that we're doing? Next piece, Till There Was You from The Music Man. My mom's turning 90, and I'm going to try to go see her. Um, I can't see her on her birthday, but I'm going to see her a couple of days later. So there's something about Till There Was You has a, <laughs> has a lot of resonance. Happy birthday, yeah. Carol Seidenberg. This, is, this piece is for you. So this is, so speaking at the beginning, we spoke about how Peter didn't want to play cello anymore and he didn't want to do this program even after he told me he would and he was stuck. And then all of a sudden, Peter has millions of pieces he wanted to do. <laughs> this one really, not only did Peter want to do this, but I completely forgot that we were going to do it. And it was only at the very last that Peter's like, what about Till There Was You? I'm like, oh, rats. I'm totally yeah, right. And the reason I remember it, it's like dessert. You know, it's, it's yummy. <laughs> it's like a good yummy sundae or something. It is yummy. Um, and I have to say, we had so much fun putting this together, um, even on the fly, that um, now we're sort of tempted to figure out a whole bunch of these we could do. For some other it's so fun. And this was really music making. I, I felt like even more so because you and Craig laid this down. You sent it to me. He gave me a part, um, the score again. It has no cello part. Oh, so right, right, right. I got to, I got to, you know, as it were, I got to compose my own cello part to this piece. I, I use all of his notes. You know, it's interesting in um, episode 3A of Performances, Season of Hope, composer Michael Ching was on as the arc trio performed um, works that he had composed for us. And one of the things that he talked about, because the arc trio is this same combination, piano, cello, soprano. And um, one of the things he talked about was that he loves the idea of a duet between cello and soprano, that he feels that it's reminiscent to him of two voices, of a tenor and a soprano. And what could be better, he says, than a tenor soprano duet. So I thought about that when, especially because the way you put it is that you really wanted to turn this into a duet. And so I don't sing the whole piece, I actually, the whole verse is sung by by you. The way that you play the cello, that you really make your cello sing, and so it makes sense. It makes sense to me that you are singing with me on this piece. So um, here we have Carol Seidenberg's birthday song, "Till There Was You" from *The Music Man* by Meredith Wilson, sung by me, Alison Charney, played and sung on the cello by Peter Seidenberg with the genius Craig Ketter on the piano. Happy birthday, Mom. bit of dessert was Till There Was You from The Music Man by Meredith Wilson. Peter, I am so grateful to you for being, for getting out of yourself and deciding <laughs> that you were going to play cello again and joining me on Season of Hope. Um, you're one of my favorite guests at Merkin Hall when 
performances is there. And um, I'm so happy that you're with me for this new COVID pivot into the virtual world. I really, I feel lucky you twisted my arm and you've inspired me. As always, every time we, we get together and, and make music, I always feel like I want to do more, more, more. So uh, you got me going. Um, here's to getting going. <laughs> that's hope, right? That's, that's a little, little personal hope. Yeah, I, I think we need to grab onto whatever, whatever hope we can find. Uh, so my hope is that we get to do this together in person soon. As I've been saying to everybody who comes on this show next time in person. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Bye bye. I close every performance the same way with Richard Strauss's 90 second long gem, Su Eignung, a piece filled with dunk, with thanks, because I am always truly so overfilled with gratitude at this point in the program. I would like to thank all the featured guests on Preformance the Season of Hope, and I would also like to thank our charitable partner, the Basser Center at the University of Pennsylvania, for their miraculous and life-saving cancer research. If you'd like to learn more about Preformances and find out how you can contribute to future programming, please visit us at www.preformances.org, where you will also see a list of our friends whose generosity enables this series to happen. My special thanks to our 11th season maestros, Mindy and Jonathan Gray, Sally Ann and Irvin Epstein, and the Gray Foundation. I'd like to thank our producer, editor, and engineer, Evan Epstein, and you, our Preformances audience, for giving us a reason to keep the music playing. And now, along with Preformances official collaborative pianist, Craig Ketter, Su Eignung by Richard Strauss. I'm Allison Charney. Habadonk. Don't.